Okay, so I'm Ben. I'm Sarah. Uh, and together we run From the Page, we've been pretty, which is a crowdsourced transcription platform. We've been pretty active in the IIIF community for about the last six years. Um, so let's get started on what we have to talk about today. Talking about more than round trip. So yes. yeah, doing yeah, better integrations. Uh, so in the IIIF world, we talk a lot about interoperability. Um, so for crowdsourcing platforms, that usually means making sure that images and metadata from digital library systems are loaded onto the crowdsourcing platform for people to actually contribute to it, and that crowd contributions get back into the digital library system. And that last bit is trickier than you might think. So sometimes we describe this as round trip integration, uh, like this connection between the Fedora repository at University College Dublin and our crowdsourcing platform from the page. But what if there are more than two platforms to integrate? Uh, what if there is more than one constituency defining the digitization process, um, you know, and each constituency is defining a process appropriate to their own systems, but that arrives from very different needs? So we're going to talk about multi-party integration um, enabling scholarly editors to use library materials and digital libraries to use metadata created by those scholarly editions. Um, and we're going to talk about this particular constellation of uh, technical platforms and organizations and use cases um, and go into detail. But um, first, we should talk about scholarly editions um, because I think that they are a particular challenge for this kind of integration. Uh, first, we better define them. Uh, scholarly editions are critical representations of primary sources created by scholars who transcribe, edit, and annotate them. Um, you've probably seen or used scholarly editions like these documentary editions from the United States. Uh, often they're in printed volumes like the papers of so-and-so. Um, scholarly editors have been working with special collections and archives for centuries. Um, but in the print world, the possibilities for integration are pretty strictly limited. An editor consults material in an archive, either in person requesting photocopies or viewing scanned images online. They transcribe and annotate the papers and publish them in printed books called letterpress editions. Uh, the problem with this is that there's no way for the library to use the edition to update their finding aids or the discovery services they have for the original materials to help other researchers who might come in later. So at best, the letterpress edition could be acquired by the library, but even then it would likely sit in the stacks separate from special collections and archives. Um, perhaps material from the edition could be integrated into the finding aids at the archives, but that process would be entirely manual. It would be somebody reading the printed edition and typing things into a finding aid document. Um, almost ironically, the, the move to digital editions may have exacerbated this problem. Um, at least a holding institution could direct researchers to both an edited volume and the archival documents used to create it. But when a publication is online, it's not really possible for the holding institution to accession it the same way that they would a print edition. Um, certainly there's no way for the users of this finding aid at the Library of Congress to search the full text of a printed edition to find the original document, uh, which is the sort of thing that they would expect from say, newspaper collections that had been scanned and OCR'd. So the Civil War and Reconstruction Governors of Mississippi Digital Documentary Edition is a new scholarly edition exploring the lives of everyday people through the lens of the governor's office. From the secession crisis through the early Jim Crow South, CWRGM is uncovering the voices that remain buried in vast archival collections. Because Americans, regardless of class, race, or gender, contacted their governors with abandon during the Civil War and Reconstruction. These papers offer insight into nearly every major issue of the age in Mississippi. And that's actually a quote from the project director, Susanna Ural. And this is a collaboration between scholarly editors, librarians, technologists, and the public. So it uses standards like IIIF and TEI to integrate a digital library system, a crowdsourcing platform, and a digital publication platform. Let's take a look at each step in this process as we trace a letter on its journey to the digital edition site we see here. We'll start at the archives. 
So the original documents are held by the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Staff there have scanned this collection and posted it in their digital library system, which is actually hosted on OCLC's content DM. So we have images and metadata on the digital library system. How do we get them out? Since this is a AAAF conference, I'm pretty sure you know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so content DM supports AAAF, the International Image Interoperability Framework suite of protocols. And we can see the manifest that shows the metadata for this letter. And it also shows the structures we need to access the AAAF image server for each page. So we can import that manifest with its image references into from the page, the crowdsource transcription platform that we run. And now it's ready to be transcribed. Members of the public can see the image of the document and transcribe it on the from the page. We store each edit made by the public or a staff member, so it's easy to view who changed what using different, a difference view within the platform. This is actually an interesting one because it's the point where one of the editors took over from uh, the original transcriber. So it's kind of, there's a whole bunch in this one. It was a good picture because it had a lot of changes, but as you kind of go through your, your, your versions get kind of smaller changes each time. We hope so. We hope so, at least, <laughs> yeah. Um, once the public has made initial transcripts, the editorial team reviews their work and adds scholarly annotations, identifying people mentioned within the text, like the secession era Governor Pettus. They also use XML tags to mark up features like superscript or underline, and they use wiki links to identify people and places mentioned in the text. These entities form subjects which will be used to index documents and let researchers navigate those documents that mention the subjects, as in this example with New Orleans. Now that the text is transcribed and annotated in the crowdsourcing platform, um, but it still needs to be published. So while from the page acts like a IIIF client to the content DM IIIF server, from the page can also act as a IIIF server. This means that any IIIF client can query our API to read from the collection of documents ready to be imported into a Mecca S. If you actually look at the second line there, this is a collection and it's in a set that we have on from the page that they've named ready for Omeka. So it's like, this is definitely the stuff that's ready to go in. Um, so this lists the document that we've been discussing along with its originating URI and a status service that describes its completion. Towards the bottom there, you can see percent complete, percent transcribed, percent needs review. All of those are the status that someone who's writing against the API, in this particular case, a developer named Annalise Daner, can query to decide if this is something that she wants to pull into the publication platform. So the TEI, um, which is linked off of this piece of the manifest here um, is what they'll choose to use to pull into to, um, Omeka S. So TEI is an XML standard that supports extensive markup of features like unclear text or gaps in the text due to water damage. Um, it also encodes annotation like the people and places mentioned within the text or the contributors to the transcription process. So the TEI is imported into Omeka S, which is the Civil War and Reconstruction Governors of Mississippi's publication platform. Yeah, there we are. And you can see what a reader does, what a reader sees. So the image, the transcript, the metadata, all together. So all that encoding that was done at the transcription time is also visible here. You can see the underlines, the superscripts, and the expansion of the word governor. The subjects that were tagged during annotation are now visible as metadata tags and can be used to retrieve other documents mentioning the same person or place. And all the metadata that came from the original Mississippi Digital Library is copied over as well. Now, we also need images, but this is IIIF, so we don't copy the images over because we just deep, you know, use a IIIF image API and Mirador 3 that's embedded in Omeka S to display the page images directly from the Mississippi Digital Library's image servers. So now we have a transcript which we could use to update the digital library metadata, but there's a big problem with that. The transcript is richly annotated and it includes names of contributors, uh, tags, a lot of text that really should not be part of a full text search. So from the page, produces uh, three separate kinds of plain text transcripts that strips or transforms the tags appropriately. Um, so this is a what we call a verbatim plain text transcript. 
Um, this is what Content DM is expecting uh, and, and most other projects, frankly. Um, so we can take this and expose it via the AAAF API for harvesting by other systems. Um, in this case, we're able to push the content, those transcripts directly into Content DM using their SOAP-based catcher API. So a push of a button will update all the metadata in Content DM and the Mississippi Digital Library. So what's next? Um, CWRGM just launched, I think, 15 days ago. Um, but we'd like to see other projects follow this model. And we think there's a lot of interesting potential here. So thanks to funding by the NAH, we've added uh, PDF and Microsoft Word exports to from the page. Um, this means it should be possible to use this kind of approach to also produce a traditional printed edition, right? So what this means is it might enable the same kind of interoperation with digital libraries, even for scholars producing letterpress editions. If they do their transcription in a system that is AAAF enabled, they can pull out the material they want in Microsoft Word and submit that to a print publisher, but the digital library could still get the transcripts back to update their discovery systems. The same grant will also fund a Jekyll-based static site generator. So that should allow editors to export standalone web pages for minimal computing and digital preservation. So let me close by describing an even more distributed scholarly editing project and some of the possibilities and challenges that it offers for this kind of reuse. So the Image du Monde Challenge uh, gathered medievalists to transcribe the Image du Monde which was a natural history and astronomical poem by Goussaint de Metz. So this is um, you know, what astronomy texts looked like 700 years ago. They were richly illustrated in illuminated manuscripts and written in rhyme and verse. Um, so the poem exists in 10 different manuscripts, uh, at least that were part of this project and different teams transcribed each of them. So the project was hosted at Stanford um, from friends of AAAF, Ben Albritton and Laura Morreale. Um, but the images themselves were hosted at three different holding institutions, each one of which supports IIIF. So the scholars running this project had very different uh, research goals and publication venues. Uh, so some of the text was submitted for publication in the Digital Medievalist. Uh, the, the scholarly edition itself was published online on TEI Publisher. Um, more of the scholarly work. It's kind of a superset of the scholarly work. So the transcripts, the annotations, but also the uh, resources that were created by the teams doing the work to list common abbreviations, uh, the, the blog posts, the different teams kept, uh, the, the, definitely the transcription conventions, right? Those were all uh, submitted for preservation on OSFIO. Um, and then there were also other outputs that were even further afield. So the Ecole Nationale de Chartres used the text of this to conduct a limitization workshop because um, you're dealing with non-standard orthography. It's a perfect test case for coming up with limits uh, for linguistic analysis or for uh, lexicography work. Um, David Risley, who's on this call, uh, also took the plain text export of Image du Monde, one of the particular um, one of the transcripts in particular, um, cleaned it up some more and used it to train a handwritten text recognition model uh, for transcribos to be used with medieval French documents. Um, so how can all of these things be integrated and should be they, right? Um, so the situation with Mississippi Digital Library and the, the Civil War governors of Mississippi, those people all talk to each other. So the, the folks at the archives are happy receiving plain text transcripts from the scholarly edition, but um, how could Gallica or the Bodleian um, or the BVMM pull in those transcripts to update their own metadata? Um, this is a situation which I think that we as a community might be able to address through uh, Issues of annotation discovery, perhaps, um, you know, more conversations, you know, there's the open question of, you know, if, if you handed any of these institutions a transcript, would they even have a place to put it, right? There, there's organizational challenges that we all have to deal with as well. Um, and finally, not every scholarly output um, 
needs to be reintegrated into library metadata, like, for example, um, these animated GIFs produced by members of the team from the, uh, from the Image du Monde manuscripts themselves. So um, with that, uh, let's open it up for questions. Um, Although, do we see the questions in Hoover? I don't know, Josh, uh, you may need to help us here. I, I am happy to read them. I think you can see them, but I, I, I will refrain from asking just why you think animated GIFs shouldn't be integrated. I actually agree. I think they should be. Well, but, I, I think uh, they're wonderful, but like, go, where are you going to put them? I, I, yeah, yeah no, 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 no. I field for that, right? That's <laughs> agreed. More, more joking on my end. Um, but I, we have a few minutes here. Um, there are two questions as of now, and folks can enter more. Um, and I'll read them both, and you can answer one or both. Um, one is, does the Omeka platform uh, have a plugin to parse DEI XML? Uh, and the other question is, how is the TEI encoding done? Okay, so the first question we would love to defer to Annalisa. Um, I know that there have existed TEI plugins for Omeka Classic for years now. Um, she has had experience using that with the Civil War Governors of Kentucky edition, pulling TEI in. Uh, so maybe. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, talk to Annalise. Uh, we're, we're, if you send us email, we are happy to um, introduce, connect, you, yeah, yeah. introduce you and connect. And then the second question is, where does the, the TEI markup come from? So that's actually something that from the page produces as one of its many export formats. So no matter what type of, of markup you do during the transcription, even if it's like our most basic transcriptions, you know, have carriage returns at the end of lines and double carriage returns at the end of paragraphs. Um, if you export that as TEI, we will export it a P5 compliant TEI with the right carriage returns and, and paragraph right. we'll, breaks. We'll, we'll, we'll wrap them in the appropriate XML tags. Right. Um, as part of this project, and this is a, a, a there was an additional feature that was funded by the NHPRC Civil War Governors of Kentucky and the Folger Shakespeare Library to allow uh, TEI markup during the process of transcription. And that was used extensively by the Image du Monde group uh, for expanding abbreviations and medieval texts, right? That was really, really important because there are so many abbreviations that um, even someone familiar with Old French has lots of trouble. Um, those XML tags that are within the editor we transform to appropriate TEI or appropriate plain text. Or appropriate HTML. Right, and we did some of that uh, with regularizations and abbreviation expansions, uh, talking with, with David, where you know, we're trying to figure out what he needs to train transcribus and, and uh, what everybody else needs for well, our People like Emily, who's display. also on, right? Yes. So everyone, right, when you develop a feature like that, you actually, if you've got three or four different groups who represent very different um, eras of history and types of documents, then you you have a higher confidence that what you've built works will work for everyone because they all have different stakes in the game. So that right. was really great to test with yeah, Folger not, and the medievalists and the, the 19th, 19th century, century Americanists. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you both. Uh, we're coming up right against the time and I want to let folks get on to maybe the next session, but um, last word I'll say, Again, a big thanks to Sarah and Ben. Um, thank you all for joining us here today. And uh, please do keep using the Whova platform. It, it, you know, if you're able, we can continue kind of questions and chat um, there. But uh, I'll end the recording here. And thanks. We'll see you later on in the conference. Thanks all. Thanks. Bye all.